Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science, and welcome to LSE's Environment Week. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I'm the director of LSE. Now, at LSE, we have a long-standing tradition of understanding the world in order to try and make it better. Our motto is to know the causes of things for the betterment of society. Climate change is the foremost long-run threat to society and will require the attention and resources of scholars and policymakers to come up with ways to tackle this huge challenge to humanity. At LSE, this Environment Week represents a major acceleration of our own efforts to do just that. The original motivation was actually bottom up demand from our students to engage more strongly with the transition to net zero and to rethink our models, our data and analysis to be fit for this purpose. Our own PhD students were an essential focus and they as part of a program called the Coast Project started by Robin Burgess and Mike Greenstone is an LSE University of Chicago initiative to bring together young scholars in the field of economics to bring the environment much more into the mainstream of economic thinking and to, and to have a new generation of economists who think about the environment from the start. Now, confronting the climate crisis will require a huge amount in terms of innovation across many dimensions, how economic growth can be made cleaner how we control for different environmental externalities, and how we protect human populations from environmental change. And it will require huge change for the discipline of economics, which has not always had a great track record in taking environmental issues into account. And we want to see a future in which economics as a discipline wholeheartedly embraces environmental issues. Now, this initiative has, has many sponsors. Uh, you know that expression, success has many fathers and failure is an orphan, so I'm gonna take that as a signal of success. It is spearheaded by the Economics of the Environment and Energy Program of the International Growth Center, I'm oh, sorry, the International, <laughs> the Economics of Environment and Energy Program, the International Growth Center, a program on innovation and diffusion within the LSE Economics Department, but it also involves funders and partners from across the school, such as the Department of Geography and Environment, the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment, Stickard, the Center for Economic Progress, and the Hayek Program. We also have collaborators from around the world, like European Research Council, UKRI, and the Coast Project. And the idea of this week is to bring the full power of economics to bear on the single biggest challenge facing humanity. We have three public events planned uh, this week. Tonight, we're going to focus on the theme of whatever it takes, is there a plan B for climate change? Where we'll examine the new technologies needed to develop to confront the climate crisis. Tomorrow, again here tonight in the same place at 6.30, we will have an event themed Ray of Hope, Innovation and the Climate Crisis, where we'll look at how existing technologies like solar energy are rapidly spreading across the world, in part driven by industrial policies to encourage them. And on Thursday, between 6 and 7.30 in the Hong Kong theater around the corner, we'll have an event called The Impact of Climate Change on Human Well-Being in Developing Countries, which will focus on how an accurate estimation of the full costs and benefits of climate change will be needed for governments to design effective and equitable adaptation and mitigation strategies. All three events and the whole week will emphasize the importance of innovation and a better balance between human activity and the environment. They're all open to the public. You're more than welcome. We'll also be broadcasting online. And if you're live tweeting from today's event, please use the hashtag LSE Environment Week. And now I'm going to turn to uh, my colleague, Professor Robin Burgess, who is one of the organizers of Environment Week and has been spearheading 
to work on innovative thinking in economics around the environment. Robin, over to you. Thank you very much, Manoush, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to say basically two things. Um, firstly, uh, that the, just a little bit on the kind of origin story of Environment Week, it's kind of interesting. So the, the beginnings were a reading group started in 2020 amongst PhD students, uh, all on Zoom. So it's like nice to be out of Zoom. Uh, and that basically then morphed into a kind of a bigger uh, grouping of PhD students from economics, from the Grantham Institute for Economic and Geography, and, and then into a program on economics of environment and energy. And then I started working with John Van Rien, who's in the audience on, we started to realize that, the, you know, unlike uh, other things that I've worked on, like poverty, this required a big focus on innovation. So, th so it's basically grown uh, from being a sort of small group of students, in the, in, uh, PhD students, to being what it is this week, which is 40 academic presentations, three public events, three master classes, and three roundtables. So that's in a, in a, you know, a two-year period. The other thing that's interesting is that the second thing I want to sort of focus upon is Basically, for the last 20 years, I've worked on development. And as, as with Manoush, there was one goal, which was eliminating global poverty. And what, what that did, that, that vision of that goal, was it brought all sorts of people together. So Manoush mainly worked on the, the policy side. Many of us worked on the academic side. But on the academic side, it cohered development and economics into a real force of bringing macro, micro, people working on trade all together. I think what we have today is a new goal, which is confronting the climate crisis. And interesting, there are some very big differences. The, the, the first big difference is a much more international issue. It's an issue that sort of faces all of humanity, not just groups of poor people in poor countries. And so it requires not just bringing people from all parts of economics, but bring uh, many people from other disciplines, as, as we'll be seeing uh, this evening. So what I would say to sort of conclude is that Development economics felt like a movement, and this was mentioned in the Nobel Prize for Esther and Abbott and Michael Kramer, and this feels like a new challenge, which is perhaps bigger and certainly more widely felt across the world, and hopefully the LSE can be a kind of a leading force in, in working on this, 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 this very important issue. So without further ado, I will pass to Ms. Robinson, who, who will be chairing the event. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you, Robin, and thank you, Manoush. I'm Liz Robinson. I'm director of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment here at the LSE. And I'm very pleased to be chairing this event and happy to be welcoming Dr. Claire Balboni, Dr. Lord Devon, going back and forth the way everyone's sitting, Dr. Anna Valero, <laughs> uh, Dr. Sean Fitzgerald, and Professor David Key. So um, I have a few of the sort of um, housekeeping announcements to start with. So just to let you all know that this is a public event um, with an in-person audience, as we can see, but it will be recorded and made available as a podcast, um, assuming, and a video, assuming that we don't have any technical difficulties. I'm going to ask you all, if you haven't already, to switch your phones to um, silent for the moment. Manoush has given you the hashtag, so feel free to tweet, hashtag LSE environment. And um, I think that's all the, all the notices I have to give you. And so what I'll do is I'll just give you a very brief introduction to our speakers, and then I'll just talk you through um, how the event's going to pan out, and then um, we'll start. So uh, Claire Balboni is an assistant professor in environmental economics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Much easier to say MIT, isn't it? But I just about managed it. Um, and an alumnus of um, LSE. That's right, yeah? Brilliant. Uh, Lord Devon, um, chair of the United Kingdom Climate Change Committee, uh, you were the UK's longest serving Secretary of State for the Environment from um, 1993 to 97, um, held many, many other high level ministerial posts, but including Secretary of State for Agriculture, Fisheries and Food between 1989 and 1993. Um, Dr. Sean Fitzgerald is Director of the Centre for Climate Repair at the University of Cambridge. Got it right. Um, Professor David Keith, Professor of Applied Physics at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Science and Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. 
and founder of the carbon of carbon engineering a company developing technology to capture co2 from ambient air to make carbon neutral hydrocarbon fuels um, you've worked at the interface of climate change energy technology and public policy for 25 years or maybe more by more. now <laughs> <laughs> And then we have Anna Valero with us as well, a senior policy fellow here at LSE's Center for Economic Performance and deputy director of the program on innovation and diffusion and an associate of our Grantham Research Institute, I, I'm pleased to say. Hopefully we've got quite a few associates of GRI here as well. So the event runs for a total of 90 minutes, so we'll finish up at 8 p.m. And what we're going to do first is we're going to hear from um, Dr. Anna Valero first, who's going to provide us with some introductory comments. And then we'll move on to a presentation from um, Professor David Keith. And after that, um, Dr. Claire Valboni is going to moderate what I, I assume will be a lively discussion among our speakers. And then uh, we're going to leave plenty of time uh, for Q&A with our audience. I'll say this now and I'll say it again. I'm going to um, ask you to keep your questions and points short. I'm going to make sure our panel keep their answers short as well, and I'll tell them to keep them short if they don't. And this is um, Welcome Week uh, for our LSE students, so I'm going to try and prioritize our LSE students in asking questions. If I, I'm not sure how I'll tell you an LSE student, but you know, um, <laughs> that's going to be the hard one. So um, without more ado, I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my absolute pleasure to be able to contribute to today's discussion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the key role for innovation in confronting the climate crisis, broadly what types of innovation are needed according to our current plans, so that might be kind of plan A, and how we might think about alternatives. So just to begin by setting out a little bit, bit more context around what we mean by plan A and plan B. So plan A very much relates to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to meet net zero by 2050. This is necessary to remain consistent with the Paris Agreement of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. This is the level that is required, as we know, to avoid the very worst impacts of climate change. Net zero involves accelerating the deployment of zero carbon solutions across the economy. This requires transformational change in energy, transport, urban and land systems. And alongside this, investments and adaptation are needed to build resilience to the effects of climate change, which we're already sadly seeing all around us. As the term net zero suggests, there's also a key role within this for methods of carbon dioxide removal or greenhouse gas removal within Plan A. This involves technological or nature-based solutions that permanently remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Plan B can be thought of here as measures that could be taken in the event that our Plan A fails. A key and controversial area in this category is solar geoengineering, which broadly seeks to bring down temperatures by reflecting a small proportion of sunlight back into space. Other types of geoengineering, such as geoengineering, geoengineering glaciers to prevent them from melting, have also been suggested. I'm just going to spend a few minutes setting the context on the role of innovation for achieving net zero and sustainable growth more broadly, and for our grounds for optimism in terms of what could be possible. But I'll also set out the risks we face which could be seen as grounds for justifying research and development in the full range of technologies and techniques that maximize our chances of protecting the planet. So how can we reorient our growth model towards sustainability? We know that the invention and diffusion of clean innovation is central to meeting net zero targets. And more broadly, when this is accompanied by complementary investments in physical, natural, human, and social capital, can be the basis for achieving sustainable and inclusive economic growth together with many other co-benefits, such as improved health from cleaner air, for example. In the UK, the Climate Change Committee has estimated that around 85% of decarbonisation between 2020 and 2035 required for net zero will involve low-carbon technologies or fuels, either on their own or in combination with crucial behaviour change. The remaining 15% relates to behaviour change alone. We know that investments in both existing and emerging technologies are required. So according to the International Energy Agency, most of the global emissions reduction to 2030 come from technologies that are already readily available. Examples are clearly renewable energy, electrification of transport through electric vehicles, and improving energy efficiency. We clearly need to double down on deploying these throughout our economies. But half of the reductions to 2050 come from technologies that are in an earlier stage of development. So you can think of this as at the demonstration or at the prototype stage. 
where further innovation is required. Examples here include advanced batteries, hydrogen electrolyzers, and direct air capture and storage. There are some grounds for optimism in terms of what is possible. A key one, and this was emphasized earlier in our masterclass, which I hope you will be able to catch up on when it's available online, a key one is the fact that we've seen that clean, technolo clean technologies are particularly effective at generating economies of scale in their production and, and in innovation. We've seen unit costs coming down rapidly over the 2010 to 2019 period, with reductions of 85% for solar energy and lithium-ion batteries and 55% for wind energy, according to the IPCC. Indeed, given the steep learning curves that we're experiencing in renewables, low-carbon solutions are already competitive in the electricity sector. With increased policy commitments, investment, and further innovation, this could occur for clean technologies more broadly. Many see enormous innovative potential as clean technologies and ongoing digitization, seen as kind of key to productivity gains in the future, continue to interact. And there are many examples, such as digital twin technologies, whereby you can model a power plant and improve efficiencies or factories or other production processes. In thinking about the transition to sustainable growth, of course, there are likely to be winners and there are likely to be losers, as in any period of technological change. And there's a transition period as well. Distributional aspects need to be managed, and this is really important when we're thinking about resistance to change and achieving a just transition as well. But growth benefits are likely to stem from the improved resource efficiency we'll see, improved resilience, and development of new clean products and services to serve growing global markets. Indeed, our analysis that we've done at the LSE has shown that there is strong potential for regionally balanced growth in the UK from investments in clean technologies, including offshore wind and ocean energy. These are areas where the UK specialises and where the estimated returns to public support for innovation are particularly high. The key question then is how can investment be channeled such that market tipping points are reached as quickly as possible? We know from the theoretical and empirical economic literatures, and again, we heard a lot about this today in our masterclass, we know there are numerous market failures, path dependencies, and sources of inertia, which need to be overcome with strong and coordinated set of environmental and broader policies, which together can direct technological change towards sustainability quickly. The evidence suggests these will include a, a robust carbon price, regulation and standards, government support for R&D, participation from civil society, and more fundamentally, a strong direction of travel to provide certainty for businesses and stimulate that required investment. We need to act on the evidence that already exists and continue to build more evidence in real time to inform policy at a time where really there's a sense of urgency. But that's the optimistic view. While rapid, pro rapid progress might be possible in theory, there are clearly risks that the global community fails to deliver on net zero in practice. Despite stronger international commitments at COP26, we're still not on track to keep warming to 1.5 degrees or well below two. Stakeholders will re reconvene this year at COP27 with the aim of closing the gap to limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. But even when ambitious plans and strategies are in place, there are risks regarding delivery. Within the UK, for example, the Committee on Climate Change highlighted important policy gaps in its 2022 assessment of UK progress in reducing emissions. Mm. And there are further policy risks within countries should governments change course, together with difficulties regarding international coordination in volatile times. Shocks such as the current energy crisis create new risks to net zero. In response, we're already seeing many countries making new investments in gas production and infrastructure, for example. That's the policy risks. Of course, there are also uncertainties surrounding the precise climate responses to increases in greenhouse gas levels with real risk that the impacts of climate change occur faster than we're expecting, particularly if tipping points are triggered. Examples there include the collapse of ice sheets, Gulf Stream currents, or destabilization of rainforests, all of which would have severe global and regional consequences. An article in Science this month says how, how even with global warming of one degrees, a threshold that's already been passed, we're at risk of triggering some, tri some tipping points. So given those significant policy and climate risks, many are arguing we should be conducting more research on proposed geoengineering techniques. So as I previously mentioned, carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, is now embedded in net zero strategies. On the more high-tech side of that, the IPCC has also set out evidence that carbon capture usage and storage technologies, in so that 
that type of carbon dioxide removal will be essential to meeting net zero globally. CCUS can be thought of as the suite of technologies that can enable carbon dioxide removals from large point sources or directly from the atmosphere, and then transport that to be injected into deep geological formations for permanent storage. This is still an emerging technological area, and so far there are few commercial applications. Despite a growing number of projects in development, the IEA considers that the pipeline remains well below what's needed for net zero by 2050. In the UK, two industrial clusters have been selected to lead deployment of CCUS, and government has increased its commitments in this area recently. Again, as our research has shown, this is also an area where the UK has some technological strengths that could be built upon as part of the sustainable growth strategy. So while CDR is already seen as necessary in Plan A, I guess here the Plan B angle would be the need to do this at a much larger scale than is currently planned should progress on reducing emissions be too slow. And the, the other, so far less understood area is solar geoengineering, or also known as solar radiation management. Here, a number of techniques have been proposed, and we'll be hearing more about this shortly. Basically, to limit the effects of sunlight on the Earth's temperature. So examples are setting up sun shields in space, making clouds or land more reflective, or dispersing microscopic reflective particles into the stratosphere. Since solar ge geoengineering does not alter carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it doesn't actually address the underlying cause of climate change. It doesn't reduce ocean acidification or bring with it the co-benefits of net zero, such as cleaner air and improved health. Some are very opposed to further research in this area due to worries that it could create a moral hazard problem, undermining efforts to decarbonize. So far, the, political addi the, the potential additional risk to people and e ecosystems are not necessarily that well understood. And there are also significant geopolitical complexities surrounding such a global scale solution. It's therefore clear, and this is the IPCC view, that exploring such solutions and how they could be implemented has to be very much in addition to the urgent drive to net zero and mitigation. So in conclusion, given significant climate and policy risks, it appears that the responsible course of action for the global community is to better understand these plan B options so that we're ready to do whatever it takes, as is the title of today's event, to tackle the climate crisis. And of course, understanding that requires building that research and development now, so that if we're in a situation of having to deploy such solutions, we are able to do it. The challenge then is how we can responsibly develop and understand solar geoengineering techniques without undermining support for greenhouse gas mitigation policies. So you need the right governance frameworks in place and how to minimize any adverse side effects. And while the development and commercialization of CDR technologies is already underway, it will be similarly crucial that it doesn't cause any sort of complacency with respect, to, with, the, with respect to the need to reduce emissions for a healthier and more resilient future. So with that, I, I'll hand over, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about all these issues from our esteemed panel of speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what? This is not the slide order, <laughs> not remotely. I see. I think they, okay. The person who set this up, set it up with the slides that were backup slides. Okay, there we go. This should work now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, and and um, I'm going to start by laying out uh, my view of what the basic responses we can do to climate change, the physical responses, and it, that's a view that's actually consistent with lots of reports going back to the 70s. And then I'll say more about solar geoengineering, not that much about the technologies, not much more than we heard there. What I'll do is, as an econ audience, is try and say a little bit quantitative about what we know about the, the ratio of harms to benefits, because I think we actually now know enough to say things that are quantitative, and I think the results will surprise you. Uh, and then. I'm going to leave till the end a bunch of uh, uh, comments, really a taxonomy of all the reasons we might be concerned about these technologies, uh, because I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned that aren't captured in a kind of simple economic analysis. So, so don't worry, I will absolutely get there. Let me start with, with sort of simplest schematic of what the climate problem is, more complicated version, the economy drives emissions, drives concentrations, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. The climate basically responds to concentrations, and that makes climate impacts that... that, that pardon? Could be. Um, so there are, in my view, four different ways. Would you like to lecture? 
Would you like to lecture? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I think. But um, I think actually I'm lecturing, and and. Um, well, if you ask me, I'll do it. Right, but I think it's best for us all. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll listen to um, Professor David's um, very interesting talk, and there will be opportunities for Q and A later. Oh, oh, it, it, it may be that almost everything I'm saying is wrong, but I think the issue right now is that I now get to say it, and then you get to argue and provide evidence that I'm wrong. Thank you. Um, so the roughly, so you can break the link. So decarbonization is a thing that breaks the link between economic activity and emissions. And I think one of the things we can say for sure we have to do. Carbon removal is a thing that breaks the link between emissions and concentrations. And perhaps the single scientific fact that is most relevant for climate change, that it turns out lots of elites get wrong, is that climate change is roughly proportional to cumulative emissions. Mm -hmm. There's a big uncertainty in that proportionality constant, but it's proportional to cumulative emissions. That means the day we end emissions, bring them to net zero, we haven't solved the problem. We've just stopped making it worse. That's very different from, say, air pollution, where air pollution kills far more people than does climate change now, about 5 million a year. But if we stop the emissions, the pollutants are gone in about five days. So very different thing. Solar geoengineering, at best, partially weakens the link between concentrations and climate change, but it introduces a bunch of new risks on its own. And adaptation weakens the link between climatic changes and local impacts. Those, to me, are the four basic things we can do. And already, you see, I've kind of diverged from our wonderful introduction. I don't think it's very useful to think about a kind of binary plan A and plan B. For one thing, I think it's pretty clear that adaptive actions are already kind of part of what we're doing in plan A. And I think the real question is how we choose these things over time, how we make good democratic risk management decisions, how we make economically effective decisions between this set of four things. The one that I think is most doubtful or uncertain about whether we do it at all is solar geoengineering. But I don't see a, a distinction. Certainly the idea that we fail in plan A and then do solar geoengineering, I can tell you right off, that makes no sense. If all you do is emit CO2 and do solar geoengineering, you walk yourself to a more and more dangerous climate state. So, so you really can't get away from the fact you have to, in the end, bring that emissions to zero if you want a stable climate. That comes from the fact that I told you that climate change is proportional to cumulative emissions. So if you want that to stop, you've got to bring cumulative emissions to zero. The big argument is how quickly we should do that, but not whether we need to do it, in my opinion. So as to what we mean by these technologies, I think I won't, I mean, since you already gave a list, that's sort of some of the list. I'd say the thing that we have by far understand the best is adding aerosols to the stratosphere, particularly sulfuric acid aerosols. That's what there's been the most research about. I think maybe quite surprisingly, it's the thing that appears to offer the clearest and most global and even benefits. And I'll give you more about the risks and benefits. I'm happy in questions to answer much more about how these things work in more detail if you want. For carbon removal, we often talk about carbon removal in a bunch of ways that I find a little unhelpful. I think the useful distinction of carbon removal is between permanent and impermanent, not between mechanical and natural or biological. So the way to think about it, at least the way I think about it, is that fundamentally the, the climate problem is driven by carbon emissions from the geosphere, from deep underground, being put into the active biosphere, where then they, they equilibrate between atmosphere and land biosphere, where trees are now growing faster because of the extra carbon in the atmosphere, and they equilibrate with the ocean. And when we plant trees, we're moving carbon, or when we put more carbon in soils, we're moving carbon from the atmosphere to the land biosphere. But if management changes, or if the climate changes, that is, warms up so the trees burn or oxidize, then that carbon goes back. There are also these things we can do that are more permanent removal into storage. And, and I think it's useful to really think of them even with different names. So to me, these things there, the lower things, are usefully called negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal, whereas I would call the upper things something like carbon banking or carbon reservoir management or essentially delaying emissions. That is not a statement that one of these is good and one of them is bad. They both could be very useful. Some of each of them have bad environmental impacts, so it's a complicated mixture. But if there's a big division, it's really between roughly permanent and roughly impermanent. And mixing those up isn't very healthy, very useful to policy. Um, one last thing, you will have heard the word nature-based solutions. My view is the right way to think about that is it's mostly an intersection set between adaptation and carbon removal. Think about trees in urban areas. Okay, now I want to say 
a little more substantive about um, solar geoengineering, I could give you lots of details and specifics. But again, because this is an econ audience, what I'm really going to jump right into is an attempt to, to, to show you some new stuff I haven't actually really not showed before or hardly showed before about the, the quantitative answers about the ratio of risk to benefit. Give you a, a, a step back a little bit. In the debate about using solar geoengineering, of course, there's a wide range of views, but I think it's a mainstream view that this is really a risk-to-risk -risk decision where costs aren't the big issue. The costs of implementing these things are so cheap that that does not appear to be a driver, at least implementing some of them, like stratospheric aerosols. The big issue is what are the risks and benefits of doing it, and, and, and what are the risks and benefits of not doing it? And the uncertainties turn out to be correlated in the two cases. So I'm going to give you some specific example of that, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how things might uh, move over time. So um, if you injected, say, one and a half million tons, which would take every year, of sulfur into the stratosphere, and you should be thinking, this is a nutty idea, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some, some more context for that in a second. If you injected a million and a half tons of sulfur in the stratosphere every year, um, you would have some mixture of, of harms and benefits. I'll give you some of them there. Um, and I'm going to focus here on really just two of them, two, uh, or two different kinds. I'm going to focus on the decrease in temperature-related mortality that comes from the cooling. And I'm going to look at two impacts, one of which is the air pollution mortality, because if we're talking about adding a new pollutant, a pollutant that we know is killing people today, we've got to really think seriously about what we know about how large that is. And also, one of the most visible risks about solar geoengineering has been that if you put these aerosols in the stratosphere, you can further accelerate ozone loss, more UV, skin cancer, and mortality. So I'm going to look at those pathways. So on the, uh, the first one is I'm going to look at this pathway, which is the chemical impacts of, of putting this aerosol in the stratosphere, the impacts on uh, uh, particulate matter in the lower atmosphere that causes health impacts. We know that from very good epidemiology. I mean, going back to London in the 19th century now, and ground level ozone. And I won't tell you that much about the details of the study, except to say this turned out to be one of these cases where we ran a big, complicated chemical model, a, a, a geos chem model, probably one of the best models that captures atmospheric chemistry well. And, and it, maybe it's relevant to say who. This was done with a colleague, Steve Barrett at MIT, who's an expert on the atmospheric effects of aviation. You may have seen him testify regarding the Heathrow Airport build. So that's, he's got a bunch of epidemiologic models and atmospheric models to measure that. And so when I started thinking we should know what the impacts of putting sulfur in the stratosphere are, I collaborated with Steve to go figure that out. It turns out to be complicated because if you put a stratospheric aerosol in, you both have this direct effect of the particulate matter, which is what we were thinking about. We have all these indirect effects where you turn out to make some air pollutants larger and smaller because you've changed the climate. I'm going to kind of ignore that. And I'll just give you the numbers. So the numbers out of that big, complicated study um, are that doing this increases global mortality for one degree C by about 7,000 a year for air pollution mortality and about 4,000 for ozone mortality. So that gives you some sense of that. These numbers have error bars that are like 50%. But on the other hand, this is a body of knowledge that's old and long. So 50 years of studying this stuff. Sulfur in the stratosphere is not a new thing. Sulfur uh, air, air pollution is something we know about. So these numbers have error bars, but they are definitely not made up. There's a real body of science there. So then the second part I'm going to look at is the impact of solar geoengineering on temperature-related mortality. So some of you may know one of the biggest deals, I would say, in kind of the climate policy and economics over the last decade and a half has been the rise of high-quality epidemiological estimates of the effects of temperature, extreme cold and hot temperature, on mortality, morbidity, and economic productivity, and actually even learning. And it's really an amazing body of literature. In this case, I'm using the new Carlton et al. study, Michael Greenstone uh, uh, study. And um, this gives you some sense of what the individual curves look like for Boston and Mumbai underneath that. And what all these curves look like is you basically find there's a temperature where death rate is minimized in those cities. And then as it gets colder, there's more people die. And as it gets hotter, there's more people die. And there's this sort of asymmetric shape to that. So you get both deaths from cold and deaths from warm. And the interesting thing is that while we all think about heat deaths, and there's a lot of heat death talk in the press that's real, if you look in the last, the first two decades of this century, in fact, it looks like net mortality effect has actually gone down. That is, there's been a benefit to warming. We expect that it will swing to be a, a big disbenefit, but so far, 
the reduction in cold deaths is actually a little bigger than the increase in heat deaths according to these models. But looking in the future, very different. So we use that model and we use a particular high resolution climate model. You don't need to worry about it too much except to say these high resolution models do a better job uh, on capturing the current variability of climate. They actually get hurricanes right without them being hand coded in Fortran anymore, which is kind of amazing for those of us who've been doing this for a while. And they get a lot of amazing features of the current climate right. So they probably do a better job on the future climate, but of course we have no way to know that for sure. And so we use this model with a simple version of solar geoengineering to produce a simulated data set of what the world looks like under solar geoengineering, including actual distributions of temperature, like the temperature distribution in Boston where we can look at heat waves. So then we put those things together to make an estimate. And this is a map of the uh, a, a map of the change in mortality from cooling one degree C by solar geoengineering, uh, looking across space, where the red colors are places where mortality's gone up. So as we cool down, the increase in cold deaths in the cold, in the cold countries actually overwhelms the decrease in hot deaths. So they actually, there's a disbenefit in the cold countries by this measure. But the population weighted is minus 13 or so. And to give you some context, you know, what is that number? Um, this gives you a look at kind of global rates. So the global mortality average is 800 per 100,000 per year. Just like do the math. People live into their 70s. Um, COVID and air pollution were both about 100. So this is about a tenth of that for one degree C. When you get up to four or five degrees C, you get about as big as COVID or air pollution is today in terms of projections of temperature-related mortality from climate change. So that gives you a number. You multiply by the population and you get this uh, uh, about a million a year reduction for one degree C. So you can add those up and make a comparison and the ratio of benefits to harms is 100 to one. That is the reduction in deaths from temperature is 100 times bigger than the increase in deaths from air pollution mortality, the sum of air pollution mortality plus the, the ozone related mortality. Now, there's a whole bunch of caveats. So, these, there's caveats in the details of these papers, so these papers actually don't use exactly the same one degree C. There's a bunch of different cases, so uh, you know there's probably like 20, 30 percent errors there. I'm not claiming that this is an estimate of the overall cost-benefit ratio for solar geoengineering. Nobody's done that. There are lots of things that aren't in here, like the things I mentioned. There's both added benefits of geoengineering that aren't, aren't in here. So there's other papers. Uh, there's a nice paper in Nature Food that shows how solar geoengineering would increase agricultural productivity. Um, it decreases sea level rise, but it also has other impacts, impacts we're not looking at, like it might exacerbate climate change in some areas, might alter the visual appearance of the sky. There's a big range of things. So this isn't an overall claim, but it's also not a trivial claim. Temperature-related mortality is reckoned to be about half or more of total climate impact. So this is a, that's a big measure of impacts. And, and say, ozone damage from geoengineering is one of the kind of most highly cited risks. And the air pollution risk is an obvious one. So these are quantitative comparisons. And the fact that the result comes out is 100 to 1. Again, I don't believe the number. That is, I don't believe it's 100 to 1. There's big error bars. But I think it makes it hard to believe that the global average ratio would be anything other than that doing a moderate amount, a small additional amount of solar geoengineering. To be clear, this is doing solar geoengineering in addition to emissions cuts. I think these numbers, which come from a range of studies with long histories, suggest that the benefits might be much larger than the harms. And for those of you who think this is very risky, and we often hear statements that geoengineering is very risky, risks need to be quantified. You can't just say it's very risky without finding out a way to weigh the risks and compare the risks to the benefits. That's what I think we all need to do. I don't think it answers the question, but I think it begins to give you some numbers. So the next part of the talk, I'm going to quickly show you something about evolution over time. This is in the solar geoengineering world, which I know is a little inbred group of scholars, although it's changing. Um, this is uh, the so-called napkin diagram that John Shepard, who uh, shared the Royal Society's 2006 geoengineering report, the first big geoengineering report by, a royal, by any national academy, uh, this is his so-called napkin diagram. It actually didn't make in the report. It was after the report. At least that's my memory. I was a, a report member as well. That outlines a basic story for how these things fit together. It's a basic story that I think is, is roughly correct if you're trying to be uh, uh, do benevolent 
you know, equitable policy. And I'll, I'll show you the, what I think is the first numerical version of this in a second. But this is the napkin diagram. And just to, well, I guess the next slide will show you how to talk it through. But this idea is a combination of emissions cuts and carbon removal, which leave a peak in concentrations, and then using SRM to shave that peak. This, this shows it to you in a slightly more easy to build up way. So if you do fossil fuels forever, climate risks grow without bound. That's just the consequence of this cumulative emissions thing. We don't know exactly what the risks are. There are lots of uncertainties. But that basic statement, I think, is pretty robust. If you bring emissions to zero, you stop them rising, but they don't decrease on a human policy relevant time scale, not on a kind of 100 year time scale. They do on a several thousand year time scale. At least some of them do, not uh, sea level. If you do carbon removal, and this deliberately has no axes on it, and we're not arguing about what the costs of carbon removal are or the environmental impacts. If you do carbon removal, you could, in principle, bring concentrations back down to pre industrial if you wanted to. That would be the, I think, the, the, the if you're a think from the point of view, a kind of ecocentric point of view, that would be the right answer, maybe not for humans. But in any case, then you have a trajectory and you have a time of peak concentrations. And one of the most common ways to think about solar geoengineering is it's a way to shave off that peak, to reduce damages during that peak. So now I'll give you a version of that with an econ model. I'm giving a talk to an econ school, so I thought I'd better include this. So this is uh, built on the so-called DICE model, the thing that Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize for, or is the, he did the DICE model and won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And this is an extraordinarily simple so-called integrated assessment model. This model attempts to model a world that is run by a global benevolent dictator. You will notice that this is not the world you live in. And, and so the applications of this to policy are not obvious. I think these models say something useful about policy we might strive for in the real world, which of course is uh, got a bunch of, of highly competitive states and a lot of chaos. So I think these models do tell us something. I like DICE because it's very simple. I don't believe the numbers that come out of any of these models. There are models, so-called integrated assessment models, that you know have coefficients for the number of refrigerators used in China in 2075. And I don't think adding all that complexity actually increases their predictive ability. The predictive ability of models of, of energy and environmental impacts, uh, historical predictions have been pretty terrible. And so I, I don't think there's much underlying prediction here, but I think they're useful. To give you a sense of how simple it is, the whole climate model here is uh, two equations. And the whole carbon cycle model is three equations. That's the actual it. There's nothing more. Um, we had to add uh, carbon removal separate from mitigation, which is not in the core DICE. And we want to do it in a parsimonious way, kind of in the spirit of DICE. And the basic thing we do here is we, we just assume that there's a point. The one number we get to choose is that 75%, which we chose in the shape of the functions, where we say basically the last quarter of emissions, it's cheaper to do carbon removal than to mitigate those emissions. It, that's our assumption. I'm not claiming I know that's true. Um, so we also have a, a really complicated way I won't get into too much involving a clever multidimensional space for capturing in DICE what we know, what we observe from climate models about the inequalities of solar geoengineering. The big challenge is solar DICE assumes the whole world uh, uh, climate impacts are measured by global average temperature. If that was really true, then solar geoengineering would be perfect because the one thing we know for sure even the strongest opponents don't disagree, is we could reduce global average temperatures or bring it back to pre-industrial with solar geo. But that's a terrible proxy. What we really care about are local impacts of temperature extremes, of sea level, of precip, of moisture, a whole lot of different things. And so global temperatures are just a proxy for the real climate changes we think about. And solar geoengineering is most definitely not perfect. So in order to, to, to modify DICE, we have a way to do it based on both the quantifying the direct risk of solar geoengineering and quantifying from models the spatial inequality of solar geoengineering, capturing the fact that it doesn't, in fact, reduce temperatures or other variables that matter everywhere. And there's lots we could have done wrong, but this is based on a, a, a whole bunch of the best climate models that have been run uh, with solar geo. And then you get a result like that. And um, I'm quite, quite proud of this in some ways. Now, this has done this, our conversation of how good solar geoengineering is hangs on a, an angle. I won't explain what that angle is, except to say when the angle is zero, solar geoengineering is basically perfect, um, uh, with just a little bit left. And so when the angle is zero, the model says, well, I'll just do solar geoengineering. And then as you gradually make the angle bigger, it doesn't do any solar geoengineering. 
I don't think we know what that angle is very well now, but I think this model does capture imperfectly some of the key time dynamics, which is that mostly we do carbon removal after we've reduced emissions towards zero, and that we do solar genome sharing earlier than carbon removal to manage the peak. That is absolutely not what most people think in the policy debate, but I think is actually a, a correct view of what you do if you do solar geoengineering at all, which I don't think we know yet. So let me just sort of drive that home with two more slides, and then I'll get to some, some last uh, counterpoints. So uh, go back one. That, this sort of says the same thing I just said, but now, now with simple diagrams, where you can see that there is a point that that day will presumably will have global celebrations, the day where we get to net zero. On that day is basically a day of peak climate risk. Really. After that, the, the net climate risk begins to decline. And the insight here is that you don't start geoengineering on that day or when you decide plan A fails. I don't really know what that means. You start it earlier. You ramp it up very slowly so you can watch for problems. And you use it to shave off the peak. And then you get out of doing solar geoengineering by doing carbon removal later. That's the sort of core insight. That's what you get from the models. Here's an even simpler version of that slide. So if I polled climate experts, or maybe this audience, about what they liked, the poll is likely they would like emissions cuts the most, they would like large-scale carbon removal not so much, but they'd say, yeah, maybe, and probably most of you would say solar geoengineering, no. And that might be the right answer. But the thing I'm saying that maybe is new is the time order should not be the same as the preference order, that the time order ought to look more like that. And that despite all the hype, I think, and moral hazard right now posed by excessive excitement around carbon removal, it actually might make sense to think about solar geoengineering earlier. So in closing, I'm going to go back and forth between two slides that attempt to show you some of the complexities I've left out in this pretty simplistic kind of uh, uh, econ, which really was focusing on the perspective of a single um, uh, global benevolent dictator, which is I think we all know isn't how we're governed. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly, and then you can pick up on a bunch of this in questions. So this is an article, uh, I think readable by regular people article that I had in the front part of science last year. This is one slide from it, and this is the, the, the a simpler version. And I'll just quickly talk way through it. I, I got four high-level categories. And you can think about different ways to divide these up. First is the physical risks of benevolent deployment. Benevolent is not omniscient. You can have accidents, you can have ignorance, you can have mistakes. There's no question that if we do solar geoengineering, there will be unexpected bad side effects, for sure. But, but it's still useful to think about if there was an attempt to do it with good intentions for some global objective like minimizing harm, there'd be a bunch of side effects you can evaluate. So that's one category of things. Then there's a set of justice concerns. This, this, these moral hazard concerns are, I think, really of two kinds. One is a political exploitation by one group against another. So I think we can expect that groups that want to block emissions cuts, like fossil rich nations or fossil fuel companies, will overclaim about how well solar geoengineering works in an attempt to argue that we don't need the emissions cuts. There's also kind of collective addiction phenomena. Maybe we all just like this quick fix and avoid the long-term work we have to do. There's procedural injustice about who makes a decision to deploy it. There's distributive justice about who actually wins and loses. There's the possibility of malevolent, malevolent use, not just, not just malevolent, malevolent, excuse my uh, tongue twisting. And then there's real changes in, in our relationship with nature that come from using technologies like this. Um, including the idea that it makes the Earth sort of feel more like an artifact, which I think is a, a genuine concern. And also, I think it's even a stronger concern, the idea that kind of tempts us to, into a kind of planetary enhancement. And my personal bias, not a rigorous view, but my bias is to think about reducing environmental uh, 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 perturbations, trying to reduce our footprint on nature so we leave the natural world to our, our grandkids closer to the way we found it. So I'll close with one slide of, of just big questions. I think the big questions in thinking about this, I mean, what I've told you about solar geoengineering, if you believed it all, should convince you that we should take it very seriously. But evidently, most of the policy community doesn't believe it. And I think the big question is really how confident we should be in these results. Is there a deep bias in climate models that makes the results of solar geoengineering better in the models than in reality? That's a real question. 
Models are not perfect, and they do have biases. And, and I think looking for those is the most important thing to do in this research on this topic. Is there groupthink? Right now, there's a pretty small group of us who've really done research on this. It's changing now. But maybe this is kind of groupthink, and we're just not seeing the bigger picture. And, and the big question, I think, is how, how can we learn more? I think I am certainly not advocating that we do solar genome sharing. I'm advocating that we study it seriously and debate how we would govern it uh, uh, both well and debate how we would govern it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, David, for a, a really interesting, in, enlightening talk. And I will move over to, um, to Dr. Claire Balboni now, who's going to facilitate the um, discussion with the panel. So I'll just sit back a little bit. Maybe <laughs> not. I might knock something over. I'll just lean back a little bit. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start by adding my, my thanks, David, for such an, an interesting and uh, uh, thought-provoking um, talk. I'm uh, delighted to be able to moderate this very distinguished panel. We've got uh, Lord Deben and uh, Sean Fitzgerald who will be uh, sharing their reflections and my aim is to move very swiftly on to their, their thoughts and what we hope will be a, a lively and dynamic uh, panel discussion before, of course, we allow plenty of time for, for audience questions. Uh, if I may, I might just uh, start with a, a, a couple of questions for, for you, David, and, and for the panel that sort of struck me particularly from your, your latter section on this very helpful taxonomy of the, the types of potential challenges and concerns that have been raised by, uh, by economic and, and other commentators on this. Uh, the, the first is, a, is about this, this set of issues around moral hazard that have come up a few times in, in Anna's remarks in, in your talk, and, and certainly that's a, a, a sort of one of the, the focuses of um, discussion on, on these sorts of technologies. So uh, uh, here, this idea that the sort of misplaced confidence in what solar geoengineering might be able to deliver might uh, detract from these very necessary efforts on, on emissions reductions. And it would be great to uh, have a bit of a, a discussion, get, get, get the panel's thoughts on how this research agenda, how implementation considerations might uh, address some of those concerns and, and the very clear sort of inter intergenerational uh, distributive justice uh, issues that, that are associated with that. Uh, the, the second area where I, I, I think it would be um, uh, interesting to, to, to get your thoughts is, uh, this is uh, relates more broadly to another aspect of the governance arrangements, which I think are clearly, uh, clearly at the forefront of, of many of the discussions around potential challenges here. Uh, and in particular, this has been um, the so-called uh, free driver effect. So in, in contrast to our sort of classical free rider structure that we, we use to often to, to, to think about the, the challenges on the abatement side, the idea here being that the, relatively speaking, as you've described, very low costs of, uh, of implementing some of these technologies uh, might uh, pose this, uh, this, mm -hmm. this challenge that essentially those who stand to gain the most from these technologies uh, might uh, feasibly be in a position to sort of go it alone, notwithstanding the externalities that this might impose on, on others. And this, as you've described, there are risks here. There are very clear distributional uh, uh, elements that are important. And, and, and this is, uh, again, an aspect where I think the governance arrangements and thinking about how those might be designed, how the, the discourse around implementation and governance of these technologies that might help to address some of these sort of economic, political, uh, ethical, really, uh, uh, challenges associated with, with these types of technologies. Uh, anyway, I'd like to uh, allow plenty of time for our, our, our panelists to offer their uh, comments. I'm going to ask uh, Sean Fitzgerald firstly to, to uh, offer his reflections, and then Lord Deben, and then hopefully we'll have a, a back and forth um, uh, on the panel before we turn to audience questions. So over to you, Sean. Great. Thank you very much, <coughs> David. Uh, really stimulating, and Anna as well. Um, so, uh, a few reflections following that. Um, and the first is um, that when we talk about a 1.5 degree centigrade, admittedly with all the caveats that David clearly laid out, it's a global average, there isn't one scenario considered by the IPCC in their AR6 that keeps us below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Just think about that. It is not something that's actually out there in the public discourse. It's hidden in there. 
in that the most ambitious, aggressive emissions reduction scenario considered by the IPCC does see us getting down below 1.5 degrees centigrade by the end of the century. But we sail through it midway, be midway before then. And the challenge with that is, as we heard earlier from Anna about the tipping points and the nonlinearities regarding the climate that, frankly, we don't really understand. There are some scary things that we don't understand. How confident am I that even with the most ambitious emissions scenario considered by the IPCC, that we will indeed get below 1.5 degrees C by the end of the century? And it therefore plays very nicely into your conversation, David, regarding uncertainties and levels of risk and things like this, which therefore needs to be factored in from an economic point of view, and hence being here at the LSE, I think that's something that we need to reflect on rather seriously. Um, the second um, is when we're talking about in, uh, levers that we have, uh, clearly there's the emissions reduction, but the levers that we have um, regarding, for example, on greenhouse gas removal, some part of that is carbon dioxide removal. Um, I really enjoyed your exposition there, David, about not thinking about whether it's nature-based or engineering. But the, the way that I like to think about it, and this uh, plays to your point, Anna, you mentioned robust carbon price. And I'm not sure that we need and will ever have a robust carbon price. The reason is that of the different ways of um, having carbon dioxide removal or greenhouse gas removal, they have different characteristics, different qualities, and Im importantly, different levels of certainty regarding the degree of permanence. Yeah. And here at the LSE, when we talk about risk return and things like this in the financial markets, you know, there are many people in this audience who are rather better versed than I am to be able to actually therefore take that issue about different levels of uncertainty and degrees of permanence of sequestration and therefore how that might be couched in a carbon price. And I think there's a lot of work that we could do by starting to think about different me measures of greenhouse gas removal and using this as a way of therefore looking at different options and valuing those. And then the third, uh, the third thing is just really getting to grips with our level of knowledge on our, I consider three levers. That's emissions reduction, greenhouse gas removal, and uh, solar geoengineering, if we're going to use that term our levels of knowledge associated with each of those, the states of development, and the time scale of potential impact. So if we care about the climate in, let's say, 2040, which are the levers that we potentially could pull that will have, could have a bigger impact than others? And I think, unfortunately, the biggest lever on those kinds of timescales is the lever that we know least about, and that is solar geoengineering. So my plea would be to actually further knowledge on each of these at pace, and in particular with solar geoengineering, and a call for going beyond the modeling that we've already done, David, and having more research where we actually increase our knowledge base, whether it's on engineering delivery systems or actually in the field, because what would my children really ask of me to do today um, and in, you know, in 20 years time when I'm a lot older dad what did you do did you do your best at actually furthering knowledge so I'm an academic and therefore it's my I think it's a moral imperative to increase our knowledge base especially on geo solar geoengineering whether we then ever deploy it or not that is a uh, a decision that will be need to be made by many many people and even the way that we do research needs to be fully inclusive. So those are my initial reflections on those three. Terrific. Thanks very much indeed, Chancellor. We'll hand over to Lord Deben, and then perhaps, uh, David, you can take, take, uh, take them as you wish, rather than uh, interrupt them. Well, first of all, I was very impressed with what you said, and not least in the manner you said it, because it seemed to me that you said it in the way which should be said, which is you want to learn more, that we don't know everything that we take the best knowledge that we have got and that we see where our gaps are and how you build from there. So I think that that was really impressive and I hope everybody recognises that as a, as a proper academic way of looking at it. The second thing is um, I've always been very leery of this kind of answer simply because as a former politician I don't want to give politicians an excuse for not doing what they ought to do with, the, with what they've got now. Because there are quite enough people out there who are busy explaining to them there's no reason to do it, or if you do do it, it's all, you know, we've got the cost of living crisis. Funnily enough, actually, the answer's 
cost of living crisis are precisely the same as fighting climate change, but that's a different issue. But the fact is there are always people there who suggest to politicians that they shouldn't do things because the deniers have become delayers. That's, that's what they do. So, mm -hmm. so I've always been very careful about saying to politicians, I mean, even the hydrogen economy, if you're not careful, this is a very useful thing for people to say, well, we'll just wait till that comes along and we don't need to do much mm -hmm. in the way. So my second issue is, is, is really a, a question of psychology. And is the third one is that too, because I, I very much liked your refusal to make this distinction between nature-based and, and other um, technologies. Um, but for a, for a different reason. The, the, the problem is that for those sensible people who recognize that climate change is the biggest issue to face us, material issue to face us, they then move on to say perfectly reasonably, because we have interrupted and upset the balance. And if they're very sensible, they say, after all, the reason that the world has been cool enough for animals and human beings, plants to be on it is because we bushes and trees drew the carbon out of the atmosphere and it was laid down and we put it back into the atmosphere. So if it got cooler that way round, it's not surprising it gets hotter the other way round, which is a, a simplistic, but it's very much the attitude that people have. So what they want to, want to do mm -hmm. is to return to the what they would call the natural level, uh, the balance of nature. It's what... Uh, um, uh, Rachel Carson, that mm -hmm. famous phrase, the balance of nature is what, what people seek to do psychologically. Now the difficulty therefore that you have when you talk about the kind of technologies that you've been discussing is that it sort of interferes with that. <laughs> That's saying we've made a bloody mess of this by what we've done. We're now going to do something also artificial and isn't it likely that we'll get it wrong? Which is why I was particularly pleased with what you said about the risks. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to another fourth thing, which is, th is the problem of risk. It is the least, I find, as chairman of the Climate Change Committee, it is the most difficult concept to discuss in general because people's attitudes to risk are really affected by a number of very basic issues. For example, People in business very often think that if you don't make a decision, that isn't a decision. Actually, not making a decision is the same as making a decision. And, and you have to recognize that. So to try to get people to realize what the risk is in not making decisions is a very difficult area, and I don't think we should ignore it. <laughs> I think it's fair. The fifth thing is... Um, you talked about a benevolent dictator. I mean, we don't have a benevolent dictator. We have some very unpleasant dictators. Uh, Mr. <laughs> uh, some of them have unfortunately come for the funeral. I mean, what we were doing with Mr. Bolsonaro, I do not know. <laughs> but there are a whole collection of people who would be very much better off not having the powers that they do. And it's not going to change. In fact, if you look at the world we live in... Uh, could you not interrupt, please? Could could you not interrupt, please? There's a chance for Q&A later. Thank you so much. Um, if, if we look at the world that we live in, there are a whole series of people that one would prefer not to be in charge and a series of other people one would hate to be in charge. But what we do know is that the world <laughs> won't change much in those circumstances. And therefore, the issues that you raise about inter interference with the system, so to speak, are particularly sharp. Mm -hmm. So my last mm -hmm. comment is simply this. Um, that we, it does seem to me, as I get older, um, that usually the answer is both and rather than either or. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you have demonstrated is the absolutely essential two things. One, we have to do everything that is possible to reduce our emissions and that that is a moral imperative and a physical imperative. And actually, it's a business imperative. It's an economic imperative, all those things. And within it are the climate justice situation, because what you so rightly said is the effect of all this, if you live near to the equator, 
is so appallingly awful. If you look at what happened in Niamey, for example, Niger is almost unlivable in because of the heat increases. One just says that. The other thing that we have to do is to prepare for the sort of timetable that you have, and I honour you for saying we might, not never, we might never use it. But if we don't know what it is and how to use it, then when the world finds itself on the brink of destruction, I tell you who will be blamed, not the scientists, but the politicians who haven't funded that research. And so for me, if politicians want to have uh, a future, they need to cut the emissions as hard and as quickly as possible and prepare for the possibility of disaster, always praying, and I mean that, and hoping that it doesn't occur. Great. Well, thank you both very much. Um, for those terrific reflections, David, that uh, obviously leaves you with an enormous range of uh, sort of topics and reflections to, to cover off in a reasonably uh, short period of time. But if I could perhaps ask you to uh, share your, your thoughts on those important points that have been raised, and perhaps we'll then sort of segue into the audience Q&A where we can bring back in the panel to, to, to make that discussion dynamic. I think I'll, I'll mention, respond on three points. Psychology, risk compensation, sort of related, and climate justice. So one of the big issues here, the sort of moral hazard, one of, some part of this is it's possible to do objective experiments with uncertainties. So you can go to regular citizens and take a group of citizens, imagine we do this in this room, and uh, you know, you're brought in for some psychology experiment, and you're all given money, uh, is, is the way this one was done, and, and you're all told something about climate, and half of you are told about solar geo engineering. And then, then at the end, you get a choice of giving that money back to, to buy some emissions reductions. And this has been done by a variety of people, now probably 10 papers, and I think it's right that all the papers, I may be wrong, have found that exposure to knowledge about solar geoengineering actually increases interest in cutting emissions. So exactly the opposite of what you might think. Now, that doesn't prove that happens at a political level. And the, 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 and, and the reason why it's happening is kind of complex. It may be that, it, it, that essentially it, it makes more salient the risks of climate change, that people may be reasoning, wow, if experts are talking about putting sulfur in the stratosphere, they actually must think we got a real problem, so we should act on cutting emissions. But whatever it is, that actually is a surprising and kind of happy, robust answer. Mm -hmm. um, second thing, all related, is about risk compensation. So moral hazard is, 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 is one word. Another kind of related term is risk compensation, the idea that when there's some thing that reduces your risk, that if you were had a, a pleasurable activity that was otherwise risky, that, that when the risk is reduced, you'll do more of that activity. And, and I think that's partly what's going on here. Risk compensation is an individual thing. But I think these things interact over time in policy in ways that, are, that often use, use many different aspects at once. So if I think about automotive safety, uh, in North America, since I was born in 63, um, deaths per kilometer traveled are down by about a factor of five. Um, that's a huge triumph of all sorts of things, of public policy. But it was achieved by some very different methods. One of them was airbags, and there were people who wrote papers suggesting that airbags and some other things like that were a bad idea because there'd be risk compensation, because people would just take advantage and drive more dangerously. Uh, we also did social measures. Uh, I think we're, most of us are much better at not driving drunk than we were when I was a kid. And we have graduated licenses, a lot of differences, different roadways. And those things fit together, and there no doubt was some risk compensation. I can tell you. I deliberately drive more casually in my very safe car now than I did in my crappy car that I had in, in my first car, which was just obviously more dangerous. And I think that's rational for me to make that choice. Um, and, and I think, and, sorry to finish the analogy, this risk compensation thing I think will be true for solar geoengineering as well. If it actually provides a reduction of risk, it might be rational to cut emissions a little bit more slowly. That doesn't mean you don't cut emissions. And, and the real issue is, does it, is you get some overcompensation, and how do the politics play out? And then last on climate justice. I think too much of this conversation is happening in rooms uh, in the north uh, with mostly white people. And I've been part, just come from New York City from the second meeting of the Global Overshoot Commission, by far the highest level commission to look at uh, the governance of solar geoengineering, carbon removal, and adaptation. Has four ex-heads of state on it, Felipe Calderon, uh, um, 
uh, the um, Hina Carr, the foreign minister of Pakistan, a really amazing range of, of, of people. And um, I can't tell you anything, this is a deliberation, I'm an advisor to the secretary to this thing, but I would say that that, that is dominated by uh, people, there's more uh, leaders from the global south in that panel than the north, and the conversation feels very different. And it's especially true because from what we see in the models, but there's reason to believe this is a robust answer. The impact of added temperature is worse in places that are hotter. And that's true on productivity, not just mortality. So the one paper that looked at what happens to global income inequality from solar geoengineering is that solar geoengineering dramatically reduces it because it basically increases growth rates in the, in the poor world because you, you've reduced the otherwise decrease. And, and in fact, it's probably a disbenefit in Sweden where Sweden actually does better being a little warmer economically. And, and that's a profound thing. This is not a small effect. It's as big as the reduction in Gini coefficient, a measure of inequality, that the US achieved in its sort of successful time between 1929 and, 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 uh, and, the war, and after the war. So it's a big effect. And I think the climate justice of this, the climate justice dialogue may have surprising outcomes. And I think we tend to think about rich countries doing this. I think it's more likely that countries that are poor will be more motivated to think about doing it. Thank you so much. So um, thank you. I'm going to open up to Q&A now. I'm going to try and get in the time. We've got three sets of three questions and answers. So as I said before, I'm going to repeat. Um, I'll probably start from the back and then work forward. Um, so I need to see I need to see more than one hand up. Students. <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. We're going to try and start with students. So are there some students? Are there some students with that? I've noticed a few hands go down since I said okay. students. Yeah, uh, we got one. We can't only have one student. I'll just start with students for the moment. Um, do we have any other students with hands up? Do, uh, yeah. Okay. One, two, and do we have a third? Yeah, you can come yep. Yep. I see. Yeah. That's one, two, three. So if we go, have we got the microphones there? We've got the first question there. We had the second question there, and we had the third question there. We'll line the mics up. And short questions, please, and short answers if you feel it's relevant to you as the panel member. Hi. Should, okay. Hi. Thank you for everything. It was really insightful. Uh, I had a question around like the development of these groundbreaking technologies. Basically, did you assess or to what extent do the development and the widespread of this technology prevent or slow down um, the cultural change or the human behavior to reduce um, or cut um, emissions, basically. So developing these carbon capture, etc., could almost act as a greenwashing act. To what extent is this true? OK, so that's a question about carbon capture and greenwashing. And the second question, please, do we have the mic lined up? No? OK. Thank you. I'm from uh, Global Politics Masters. Uh, I, I find there is an intrinsic problem uh, with geoengineering, which is maybe more of a philosophical, or political, uh, theoretical problem, which is that this, this sort of brave new world scenario um, is completely totalitarian. Like, all of us will be affected by it, yeah? So it's not like some people in the world can embrace a more natural world and some people will go in this brave new world direction, it will affect us all. How are we gonna, how are we gonna deal with the democratic decision making or what other kind of decision making? If you would like to comment on that, thank you. Thank you, so that was a question about the fact that we're all affected. So how does that link to our own sort of, um, and yeah, third question? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation for us, first of all. And my question is, on how do we get on the right uh, mitigation and hierarchy kind of like timing that was described. Um, as of now, it kind of like seems that we're kind of going in a different direction, especially with the kind of private industry and the big players that are kind of like your fossil fuel industry, agriculture industry, fast fashion industry that are, that would do anything to basically invert that mitigation hierarchy and would invest in carbon capture, but also CCUS or carbon trading, nature-based solutions, but not reduce their emissions. And at the same time, this is kind of on the other side married by a public and kind of like government incentives of actually investing in, C in CCS for right reasons. But at the same time, it seems that we're not following quite that trajectory of reducing emissions first and CCS later. And a big question on how do we get on the right track? So panelists, um, any initial thoughts to answer any of those questions? Well, can I just about getting on the right track? I mean, I think the, the thing is, I, 
I think about, about Extinction Rebellion. I mean, I'm on their side. I want to do these things, but I know we can't do it by five years' time. But what we have to do is everything that we can do, and uh, we have to keep the feet to the fire. So, uh, for example, I've just written to the chairman of Shell to say, you're supposed to be claiming this, but you're not meeting the Climate Change Committee's uh, demands for what you have to do to continue to take such gas out of the North Sea as we will need until we stop using it altogether. You're not doing it. So until you do it, nobody will believe you. Now, we've got to do that right the way across the board. And I do think the additional demands now of the regulators of various sorts to demand that, that greenwashing is absolutely unacceptable. And we have to fight that all the way along the line. And customers and consumers and all of you, I mean, I should not only be down at your local member of parliament's um, surgery whenever they hold one, but also demanding about the goods that you buy, not buying the ones, never buying anything from Exxon because they are not changing and therefore you never buy anything from Mobile Exxon. And there are a lot of other people like that. We have got to, we've actually got to mobilise to make it impossible for people uh, to go on with the greenwashing. It's the only way forward. It's not satisfactory, but there isn't an alternative, so we just get on with it. Um, so I'm going to respond to the question from the back, which is about you know, climate change is going to affect us all, and therefore how do we make decisions? Um, you're completely right, I think, climate change will affect us all, but alas, as uh, David mentioned, uh, we will not all be affected equally. Um, and that is a very, very big problem. And in fact, when David um, presented the impact on economics, uh, th those were actually lovely numbers, and they showed differences, and they were e fairly easy to triangulate, which is where uh, that would have come from. But there are some other, other economic risks over slightly longer timescales, let's say over 30-year timescales. Uh, and one of those, for example, is going to be the increasing severity and frequency of severe weather events. Yeah. So South Vietnam, for example, is now projected to have annual flooding by 2050. Basically, that will then wipe out the, white, the, the rice harvest. So we're going to see potentially uh, mass migrations of people, countries that are not going to be livable. What about the low-lying island states? And therefore, what we really need to do, in answer to your question, how do we make decisions, is to bring countries that are going to be especially affected and least able to adapt to the effects of climate change, bring them into the room to help, in, A, inform what we should be doing in terms of developing technology, for example, solar geoengineering, but also globally in terms of, therefore, the emissions cuts and the solar, solar radiation uh, greenhouse gas removal. So we need to bring all of those people together. And actually what scares me most from a risk point of view is that when things get out of, con get out of control and we've got a country whose harvest has failed for three years on the trot, they've got massive problems, what lever are they going to try and pull if they don't, even if they don't know actually all the, there is to know about it? So the, this prospect of solar geoengineering, what scares me most is that it might get attempted at scale without there being the proper research that actually we are duty bound now as a moral imperative to progress knowledge on that base to ameliorate the risk in that particular instance. And, uh, to, totalitarianism is, a, is, is about procedural justice. It's about how the decision is made. You can make a totalitarian decision to have a certain kind of fridges as maybe the Soviet Union did. Um, climate change and global ozone and uh, global solar geoengineering are all things that do affect everybody, yes, absolutely, but not more so solar geoengineering than CO2. And the question of how we make decisions, how democratic it is or isn't, is, is in principle kind of independent from the question of who gets affected. That's different than the distribution of outcomes and how the decision is made. And one last thing, it's sort of easy to talk about innovation. That was the setup for this. These solar geoengineering technologies are not new and they're not innovative. The first big report on climate change that went to the most powerful leader in the world went to President Johnson when I was five, uh, three years, two years old, and that had solar geoengineering in it. It was in a lot of the reports right up to National Academy 77 and early 80s, and then there was a kind of suppression of it, to be blunt, because the environmental left was too concerned about moral hazard and said we shouldn't look at it. But the ideas here are not really coming from industry, and they're not really new ideas. This is really coming out of the climate science and, and an application of that science. 
Okay, I'm gonna take three more questions, hopefully from students, and then I will take from some of the gentlemen and um, other people in the front. So do we have any more students? I will take some people who are non-students afterwards, I promise we do have time. So, student. <laughs> student, um, and we have one there, and... Oh, oh yes, yeah, sorry, have you not answered the question yet? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. That's I knew someone. I've got bad facial recognition. So one, two, three, and then we'll have you as number four, okay? So and and then afterwards, um, I will I will open to non-students, okay? Thank you. Uh, great. Hi, I'm a student in the economics department here at LSC. So we've. I want to touch on the theme of psychology and, in particular, the role of perceptions around new technologies and perceptions about science. I suppose. So we've seen, even within the environmentalist movement, concerns that I would broadly say are against scientific um, knowledge. And I don't want to open debates on things like nuclear or the role of science in agriculture, but we've seen that a lot of narratives that have emerged are against what science is saying. And so how can we, so even if solar geoengineering, for instance, is shown to be um, the solution, how can you work against those narratives, what do we need to be thinking about now um, for how people perceive the role of these new technologies? Thank you. So, um, and our second question, do we have a mic? I, I thought it was a third one, but I'll go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess my question is um, if you could give your opinion on how the war in Ukraine and I guess other potential geopolitical um, things that may come in the future will affect the energy transition. We're already um, witnessing a change in discourse by some leaders on energy, so how do you think this will affect um, this topic? Thank you, and thank you for keeping the question short. I really appreciate yeah. that. We've got a question there. Hi, I'm Adbase. I'm a first-year politics student. The Economist recently ran a piece indicting ESG goals for investments due to it being a composite indicator and producing and different agencies producing different results. Would you be in favor as a panel of axing the S and the G and focusing solely on uh, carbon emissions? Fantastic, so E being carbon emissions, yeah. yeah. And was that, I thought there was a fourth question, but if not, we'll go to the panel and, oh, no. Okay. Okay, and then um, if we can keep answers short, we can have time for um, a couple more questions or points after that. Maybe I'll pick up on that last one. Uh, it's important to say we've had big environmental successes. The air is much cleaner, not just in the rich world, but in the poor. There's less lead, global ozone. All of those, in general, have been done by rules. Rules that say you can't do X and you're free to compete, do whatever you like under that. I am deeply skeptical about some of the kind of vague corporate com commitments in ESG, I think in the end, this gets done by rules. And then people can freely uh, do what they want under those rules. That's how we've solved the problems before, and we have solved problems before. Well, I agree with that bit. If I just kind of turn to the geopolitics thing, um, we, we've got a very clear view about it, which is that you have to stick to your fundamental actions, and you have to continue with those. There may be periods of time when in order to uh, release, because you can't get oil, let's say, gas from Russia, or you can't get uh, things from dictatorial regimes like Saudi Arabia, you can't do that. You may have a te temporary period when you use more of your own than you would others, but it doesn't help the cost of living crisis because the price of gas won't be affected at all. That's what really makes me cross, are those ludicrous people who say, because the price of gas is so high, let's have some more gas. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> the price of gas is fixed internationally. What you then have to do is to have renewables which are much cheaper, and the more you use them, the more you set them up, the price goes down and down. When I ran an offshore wind company, we were doing it at 200 units. It's now down to 47. I never thought we'd get down to 100. It's quite amazing. The the difference that has taken place. But that's what you have to do to change the world. You have to make the market work sufficiently to deliver that and stop people telling lies. It isn't an answer to have more gas. Anna? Do you want to come in, Anna? Um, yeah, 
I mean, I, I was going to agree, particularly in, in the case of the UK, there's very little evidence that shale gas, for example, could actually shift the dial on the on it won't problem. At all. And obviously, investments in renewables plus energy efficiency are ab absolutely crucial and just enhanced in their urgency by the current crisis. Um, on ESG, I also read that article and have been following that debate, and it seems very clear that if investors, if we want to channel investment into fighting climate change, we need to be able to inform investors which investments will actually do that. And I think there are cases with a company that might have a good ESG rating for a reason that doesn't relate to their climate um, goals, but more to do with how resilient they are to climate change, or perhaps the, the so social or the governance parts of it. So I think given the urgency of the challenge, we need to be able to delineate that more effectively. And finally, on the psychology, if I may, um, not my area of expertise, but it seems that a very big part of that psychology and understanding science has to come through education, whether it's through our education system or through public information and education campaigns. I think all of us have so much we can learn on this, even those of us who are quite engaged in it. But it's also a trust in science. So it's trust in the IPCC that this is a panel of experts. Even if you don't understand all of the, the science, you can trust it because you know it's very rigorous. If I may so just, I, I will be 30 seconds because I know. No more. Yeah. Yeah. So I can bring in a couple more the, questions. Um, I, I also think that the very helpful taxonomy that David presented towards the end of his, his presentation also plays a really sort of important role in guiding these discussions in terms of clarifying what exactly the, the, the positions on each side of these arguments are. And surely people come to different positions on those things, but it, it provides a help framework to think through, sorry, to, to, to think through um, what, what those debates are so that it's evidence-based and informed of the discussion.